All right, hi everybody, how's it going? And welcome to another video. Now, I hope everyone's doing well. I know this has been a difficult year, this 2020, and I really hope everyone's doing well. I wish everyone well, but I hope everyone has had time to, you know, work on personal projects, maybe reconnect with people you haven't talked to in a while. I know I've done some of that, and I'm glad I did. But yeah, it's been a difficult year this year, and I really do hope everyone's doing well. I hope everyone stays safe. But I hope also that everyone has a very prosperous 2021. You know, hopefully that'll be a better year for more people. Uh, myself, you know, on, on some levels, it's been a good year. You know, it's been an okay year financially. It's, for me, it's been, actually, it's been a good year financially. It's been a good year create, you know, in terms of creativity. You know, I've been able to work on some of my personal projects that I've been wanting to do, things I've been wanting to get out, things I still actually have yet to get out. But yeah, I, I really wish everyone well, hope everyone's doing well, and do stay safe out there. Now, in 2020, there was somewhat of a tragedy in terms of the people we've lost. Two of them I'm going to talk about in this video, and that's going to be Eddie Van Halen of the band Van Halen and Leslie West of the band Mountain. Both these people have passed away this past year. They are both hugely influential on a lot of guitar players. So I do want to talk about both of these musicians in this video. But uh, yeah, so like I said, I do want to talk about them. I have done these like rest in peace videos before, but I want to talk about, you know, Eddie Van Halen, you know, his life, his contributions, the albums he put out. But I also want to talk about the scene that he was a part of. Because Eddie Van Halen was a part of kind of an interesting music scene in Los Angeles, California. I do want to talk about that scene because with music scenes, you had in California, this like 1960s music scene that, you know, the birds were a part of, Frank Zappa, you had the Mamas and the Papas and the Doors. So you had that whole 1960s music scene that a lot of people are aware of, and that was in Los Angeles. Of course, you also had a San Francisco scene as well that was more underground, and less commercial, but yeah, the L you had that LA scene, but then after that scene, you had a another scene happen, and this was a scene that was kind of like a prelude to that 1980s glam metal scene, but you had a scene in the 70s where you had a lot of different bands coming out. A lot of these bands were influenced by the glam rock bands of England that were coming out, such as Slade, Sweets, Mott the Hopal, uh, just you know, different bands, Humble Pie, David Bowie. But there was also a California culture kind of thing that these bands were influenced by as well that you could hear in a lot of bands that you can hear in Van Halen. But you did have this scene, the, this interesting scene, all these bands coming out. I do want to talk about those bands because a lot of those bands would play shows with Van Halen. And yeah, it was just an interesting scene. I mean, a lot of different bands playing shows. You had bands like YNT, although YNT were from San Francisco, they would drive down to LA and 
play the shows at all those iconic rock clubs. You know, and YNT was a great band. If you haven't heard of YNT, I definitely recommend checking them out. At the time, they were going by the name Yesterday and Today. They had in the band uh, Dave Menachetti, singer, guitar player, probably one of the better singer-slash-guitar players of all time. I mean, I, I also think Derek St. Holmes is great, but yeah, Dave Menachetti would definitely be a, one of the better singer-slash-guitar players. Y&T were a great band. They would play big shows at, like the Starwood. A lot of bands would open for them. Motley Crue, in fact, opened for Y&T at the Starwood. That was their first show, actually. But yeah, Y&T, kind of an overlooked band sometimes. I mean, they did have a hit, a song that was on MTV called Summertime Girls, but that song sounds a lot like Van Halen, and that wasn't really the Y&T sound at all. But yeah, it had a very, that song, if you watch the video for Summertime Girls, you can see very Van Halen-ish, really sound like David Lee Roth era Van Halen a lot. I was probably the most Van Halen thing I've ever heard um, to sound like Van Halen, not called Van Halen. But yeah, definitely check out some YNT stuff. You know, they have greatest hits albums. You can find their albums on YouTube. Definitely worth looking into because that was a great band. And as far as I understand, I believe they still play shows today. I believe Dave Menachetti is the only original band member still alive but you know definitely something to check out YNT were a part of that scene even though they were from San Francisco but they were still a part of that LA scene you also had another band on that scene called Legs Diamond and Legs Diamond Gene Simmons actually took a lot of interest in this band when they were coming out that he really saw that they had some promise. He wanted to manage them, get them a record deal. They ended up getting all that stuff on their own and kind of ignoring Gene Simmons, which caused them to kind of grow apart. And I know maybe if Gene had been involved, maybe Legs Diamond would have been bigger. But they did get signed and they did put out some good albums that you could check out as well. It's a great band, Legs Diamond. You know, and they had albums coming out in the late 70s. You know, they were one of those bands that was having some good stuff coming out at that time. But, uh, yeah, so it was it was an interesting scene. You know, you had another all-girl band, The Runaways. The Runaways would have some fame. They, I think, are, by 1980, I think they were pretty much done. But they... Uh, did put out some records, did gain some fame. They were an all-girl band, but not the first all-girl rock band. There was another band alongside them I've heard about called the Orchids. They were another all-girl rock band at the time that was a part of this L.A. scene. And then, of course, you had Van Halen. Now, I want to talk a little bit about kind of the history of Van Halen. As you know, Van Halen was formed by the Van Halen brothers, Alex and Eddie. They were from Amsterdam, Holland. They came over to the United States, moved to Pasadena, California, back in the 60s. Their dad was a jazz musician. Their mom wanted them to play piano. They began playing piano. Eddie began winning these piano competitions. Even though he couldn't read music, but all, even though he could not read music, that didn't matter because you weren't allowed to look at sheet music in those competitions anyways. So it didn't matter that he couldn't read music because you weren't allowed to look at sheet music. And I think Alex was also in those competitions and he also did well, you know, also. But yeah, Eddie was winning these piano competitions. So he became a fairly decent piano player at a very young age. But he, you know, wanted to get into rock. He became a big Cream fan. He really liked Eric Clapton a lot. However, before that, he wanted to be a drummer. He had gotten a drum kit. And then at some point there was a switch where Alex 
Alex played guitar, Eddie played drums, but then there was a switch, and that happened supposedly because Alex had learned how to play Wipeout on the drums. Wipeout, you know, has this like intricate drum part. Alex figured out how to play it, and he was like, okay, we're switching. They switched, and Eddie really took to the guitar. He really took to the guitar, began playing it a lot, began figuring out songs. Very quickly, he could play any Cream song. Cream was his band. He would play a lot of Cream, although he also did like Mountain as well, and more on that in a bit. But, yeah, he liked Mountain, you know, Cream, all these different bands, and uh big Cream fan, even though he did not sound like Eric Clapton. I hear much more of a Montrose influence on the Eddie Van Halen, on the Van Halen sound than I do Cream. Much more of a Montrose influence, which, you know, that's why Sammy Hagar would work so well as a singer, because he actually influenced Van Halen when he was in Montrose. Although they didn't know who, you know, Sammy Hagar was at the time, because, you know, it was not really an information age. You would buy albums, you would listen to them, but I know the Van Halen brothers were big Montrose fans, and that Montrose sound really formed the basis of the Van Halen sound. So Van Halen had formed, they, I want to say they formed in 1972. And they had as their bass player, because they were a three-piece in the beginning, Eddie Van Halen on guitar, Alex on drums, and their bass player at that time was a guy by the name of Dennis Travis who had to quit the band when his father got a job 300 miles away. So he quit the band. They got another bass player, a guy by the name of Mark Stone. Mark Stone would be in the band for a little bit. Eddie would sing. Then they kind of realized, okay, maybe we should get a singer, you know, Eric Clapton is the singer of Cream, but, you know, Led Zeppelin seems to be doing better than Cream, and they have a guy who just sings, so maybe we should do that as well. So there was a band by the name of Red Ball Jet that had a singer in it called David Lee Roth, and apparently David Lee Roth owned a PA. I guess he had a nice PA. His dad was a surgeon, so he could afford a good PA. And, you know, they decided, okay, well, he's, they would rent the PA, supposedly from David Lee Roth, and they decided, well, if we could get that guy in the band, that would be better because he has the PA. Now, I find some of that hard to believe. I mean, they must have known that David Lee Roth had this charisma to him, that he was this great front man because, you know, he's one of the best front men of all time. And, you know, people have been critical about David Lee Roth's voice. His voice is actually different than a lot of other singers at the time. He didn't try to sound like Robert Plant or anything. It was a more soulful kind of voice, kind of like an R&B type voice, because David Lee Roth's band, Red Ball Jet, the band he was in before Van Halen, wasn't even rock. It was actually R&B. So... They got David Lee Roth in the band in 1974. Mark Stone was still in the band at that point, but Mark Stone had this dilemma where he's very devoted to his schoolwork and his studies. Van Halen was taken off, and he didn't have time to devote attention to his schoolwork and a band that were kind of undeniable. I mean, it looked like Van Halen was really going to make it. So... You know, he was told that because he wasn't as dedicated to Van Halen, Alex, who kind of managed the band at that point, told them that, you know, he was out of the band. And they replaced him with another bass player, a guy by the name of Michael Anthony, who was in a band called Snake. Michael Anthony was a great backing vocalist. Uh, he was in college at the time as well, but even though Van Halen were taking off, he actually quit school, which did lead to a falling out for a time with his parents. But then, of course, you know, when Van Halen made it huge, they understood. So, uh, 
yeah, so that happened. You know, Van Halen was really picking up steam in 1974. They were trying to play more clubs on the Sunset Strip because David Lee Roth felt that, you know, if we could play those clubs, maybe an a &R guy will be there. They'll see us and we'll get signed or we'll get a manager. You know, because in those days, it was kind of a thing where they would sign bands on the Sunset Strip, but you kind of had to sell a lot of tickets. And they would, if a band sold a lot of tickets, it would kind of be thought of, okay, well, they're selling a lot of tickets. Then, you know, because they're selling a lot of tickets, they'll probably sell a lot of records too. So let's sign them. So that was kind of the way things worked at that time. You know, and you know probably some bands that just weren't selling a lot of tickets might have sold a lot of records, but those bands weren't getting signed because, yeah, you had to sell a lot of tickets for these record labels to take notice. That was just how it worked in those days in that scene. But, uh, yeah, so anyways, Van Halen really, you know, began to pick up momentum. Like I said, it looked like they were going to make it. Now, some people said, you know, great band, but the singer's got to go. You know, the singer is too much like another singer, and that was Jim Dandy from Black Oak, Arkansas. David Lee Roth did ask Jim Dandy, the singer of Black Oak, Arkansas, if he could take from his image and gimmick a, a little bit. And Jim Dandy said yes. You know, he said, yes, you could. That's fine. I've taken things from people as well. So it's okay if you do as well. So he did. And, you know, I'll put the link below. There's a concert called Kale Jam 1 where Black Oak, Arkansas played. You could see Jim Dandy singing. I'm, seems a lot like David Lee Roth to me. But, you know, he had David Lee Roth got Jim Dandy's okay. So... Yeah, I guess, you know, it was fine. But he definitely looks a lot like David Lee Roth. It's, you know, David Lee Roth's whole image. And yeah, if I could find the clip, I'll, I'll definitely put the link to that Kale Jam 1 below so you could take a look at that. Let me know if you think Jim Dandy seems a lot like David Lee Roth. But uh, I know people were making that comparison. Not everyone, because not everyone was familiar with Black Oak, Arkansas. You know, they were a band. I don't know if they were really big. I know I read a lot of rock biographies, and it seems like a lot of bands that were around in the 70s played shows with Black Oak, Arkansas. So, you know, I guess they did have some popularity. I've been told that Elvis was actually a pretty big fan of Black Oak, Arkansas, that that was a band from the 70s that he liked a lot. But, uh, yeah, any, anyways, um, they were really kind of catching momentum, Van Halen, at this point. Uh, Mark Stone was told to leave. Now, I do want to say something about Mark Stone, the first bass player of Van, or technically the second bass player of Van Halen, if you count Dennis Travis. But Mark Stone actually had said that not a day went by where he didn't think about what could have been with Van Halen. Not a day went by where he didn't think of what might have been and he would feel depressed about it. You know, kind of wonder about that. You know, because he's kind of, if you think about it, Mark Stone is kind of like the Ron McGovney of Van Halen. You know, Ron McGovney being the first bass player of Metallica. Uh, he was basically replaced by Cliff Burton when they saw how good Cliff was. But I, I don't think Ron McGovney has any regrets or anything. You know, I, I think he's okay with it, but supposedly Mark Stone was not. You know, it would, you know, kind of haunt him every day, apparently. I mean, he would think about it. And uh, he actually passed away around the same time Eddie did, if I'm not mistaken. So rest in peace, Mark Stone. But uh, anyways, Van Halen was really catching momentum at this time. 
you know, they were playing a lot of parties. They would play these party gigs. Thousands of people would supposedly show up to these parties. They talk about helicopters flying above. Thousands of people would show up because there was a buzz that had been building up around this band that had a really good guitar player in it as well as a really good singer. And Van Halen were playing a lot of cover tunes at this point. Supposedly Van Halen were said to be able to play about 300 different covers. And they would play the popular stuff like ZZ Top, Led Zeppelin, Aerosmith, Black Sabbath. But they would also play obscure stuff like Cactus, Budgie, Captain Beyond. Yeah, I know they would play In For The Kill by Budgie, which is interesting because... You know, a lot of people didn't really know of that band back then. But uh, anyways, yeah, they were playing these shows. David Lee Roth felt that, you know, they had to go to the Sunset Strip and play those clubs if they wanted to get noticed. So they did. They went to a place called Gazari's where they played Gazari's from 19... 74 until, yeah, April of 1974 until, I want to say October of 76, they played Gazari's. They would play a lot of shows. Gazari was this guy, you could see him if you watch the film The Decline of Western Civilization Part 2. He is in that movie, but yeah, he was a guy kind of dressed like a Chicago gangster. He had this club, a lot of bands would play it. He didn't like the heavier music, but uh, he did have these bands play the club because he knew, you know, people would come see these bands. He knew of knew that there was this buzz, I guess, around Van Halen, so he had Van Halen play this club, and, you know, Van Halen would play their covers, and they would play other clubs as well, too, and the great thing about the internet is you could find some of these old shows, and you could hear Van Halen playing these cover songs, and you know, the cover tunes, even though they were cover tunes, they really did sound like Van Halen, you know, these cover songs. But, uh, yeah, definitely check that out. There's a lot of stuff from, you know, Van Halen's club days that I've come across or, you know, some interesting shows. I know I was listening to one from, like, 75. And Van Halen had it back then. They had it already at that time. Now, as the story goes... Gene Simmons came to Los Angeles because he had heard about a band called The Boys that had a guitar player in it that was really good by the name of George Lynch. And Gene Simmons had become a George Lynch fan and he wanted to get George Lynch and The Boys, you know, a contract. However, Van Halen was opening for The Boys and he heard Van Halen and he was absolutely blown away by the Van Halen sound. He's like, I got to get these guys recorded, got to get them a record deal. So he brought them back to New York. They recorded at Electric Lady Studios, I believe it was. I'm pretty sure it was. And they put out a recording. I know I was listening to the recording not too long ago, and it was very good. But for some reason, I know Kiss's manager, Bill Coyne, wasn't really interested in working with Van Halen for whatever reason. I don't know why. And uh, Van Halen eventually did end up getting signed by Warner Brothers. I know people would talk about how Eddie used to complain about, you know, why can't we get signed, you know? A year later, they did get signed by Warner Brothers. And in 1978 the first Van Halen album would come out. Now, I really, there's something I really like about 1970s metal. And what I really liked about it was back then, there wasn't like all this restriction. Like, for example, in the 80s, there would be a lot of this like division. And they'd be like, okay, we're a metal band. We can only play this and this and this. And we don't play this. We just play this kind of heavy music and that's it. You had some of that in the 80s, but in the 70s, you didn't have that. So, for example, you know, a band would play a song and maybe there would be a jazzy interlude in the middle or a psychedelic rock interlude. 
For example, like Stranglehold by Ted Nugent has that real cool, like, jazzy interlude in the middle of it. You know, in, in the 80s, a lot of bands were not doing that. They're just kind of like, okay, we're a metal band now. We're going to stick to this. Metallica, however, did do some of that. And that's what I always liked about Metallica because they kept that 1970s tradition alive of having those kind of intricate interludes and songs and stuff. So I really always liked that about Metallica, how they would do that. They have like a classical sounding intro or interlude. But yeah, in the you know 70s, it was like, you know, you didn't have that you know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, in the 70s you had more of that, and I, I really, I really liked that. I liked that they had more of that in the 70s. And the example I'm going to use, of course, is The One, you know, the song The One, where all of a sudden, in the middle of the song The One, there's this, like, doo-wop thing, you know, and I remember hearing that, I'm like, what is this? But yet, somehow, Van Halen made that work. They made it work. You know, and it makes it a cooler song, I think. You know, so I like that bands were doing that back in the 70s. It's what I love about 70s metal. In the 80s, like I said, there, there wasn't that, you know. There was kind of more like, okay, now we're this kind of thing, so we got to stay in this box. We can't leave this box. You you had that then, and uh seemed like you had more freedom in the 70s to explore and go down different avenues, try different things, you know. But, uh, yeah, anyways, you know, getting back to Van Halen specifically, you know, Van Halen came out with that first album. Now, you know, I would be lying if I said I grew up being a big Van Halen fan. I wasn't. I didn't become a Van Halen fan until my college years where my friend had played some Van Halen for me or I heard the intro riff to Ain't Talking About Love and I'm like, this is really good. So I went out and I bought the first Van Halen album and really liked it. That's my favorite Van Halen album is Van Halen 1. You know, great album. One of the all-time greatest debut albums. In fact, I think I'm going to do a video on, you know, my favorite or all-time greatest debut albums from bands. I think Van Halen has one, you know, with that first Van Halen album. That was an excellent debut because they had a number of years to work on it. You know, they really honed that sound in the clubs. And, you know, the other albums are great too. You know, the David Lee Roth era albums are, are strong albums too. Some interesting stuff. I know Fair Warning is often an album cited by guitarists as being a favorite. It's a very guitar album. I know Eddie after 1984 came out, he wanted to kind of go in that direction more. I don't think David Lee Roth wanted to. But, you know, definitely Fair Warning was a very guitar-y album. It has, like, you know, Mean Street on it. And, you know, just some interesting stuff. And a Women and Children First have an interesting song on it, Tora Tora, which actually sounds kind of like a Black Sabbath song. You know, I was surprised when I was listening to that how Sabbath-y it sounded. You know, it sounded like something you wouldn't expect Van Halen to do. But, uh... Yeah, Van Halen would really get on a momentum after this first album. A lot of people really liked it. I know when I first heard Van Halen, it was actually the Sammy Hagar era Van Halen. And I like, you know, like a number of fans, I like the David Lee Ross stuff more. I like Sammy Hagar, though. I do like Sammy Hagar's solo stuff, and I love that first Montrose record. I think had Montrose kept that formula, kind of been like ACDC, and kind of kept the winning formula, I think Montrose would have been huge. However, Ronnie Montrose did want to explore and take the music in new directions. And Paper Money, you know, the second Montrose record, wasn't as popular among fans as the first. 
You know, because, yeah, that Montrose could have been really huge had they kind of kept that same formula. I mean, Iron Maiden would even cover a lot of those songs. But, uh, yeah, so Van Halen was really on a momentum. They would actually, because Van Halen and Black Sabbath are both on Warner Brothers Records, they would tour together. And, you know, Black Sabbath talk about this, you know. They talk about how they felt that Van Halen kind of blew them off the stage. And, you know, one simply did not blow Black Sabbath off the stage. <laughs> okay. But, yeah, Van Halen was this very energetic band and, you know, had the front man of David Lee Roth Black Sabbath, I although, you know, I really do like what Black Sabbath was doing at that time. I mean, I like Never Say Die and Technical Ecstasy. I know sometimes fans don't speak highly of those albums. I think those are great albums. I really do. There's some great riffing on it, too. You know, Tony Iommi always, you know, great guitar riffs. But uh, anyways, yeah, Van Halen was really kind of picking up some steam at this point, playing bigger shows. And uh, I know they played some shows with like Journey and played, I'm not sure if Van Halen had played Cal Jam 2 or not. I know there was a Cal Jam 2 that later happened. Uh, but yeah, like I said, I'm not sure if Van Halen was on that or not. But uh, anyways... Yeah, just uh, picking up steam. Then, you know, they would come out with 1984, had more keyboards on it. Like I said, you know, Eddie Van Halen was a great piano player. He applied what he had learned on piano to the guitar and was able to do that quite well. But he did return to keyboards on the 1984 album. He had songs that were big hits like Jump and... I think that might have been Van Halen's first number one, if I remember correctly. Don't quote me on that, but I think it might have been. Um, you know, Van, obviously Eddie's playing had been hugely influential by people. People talk about the two-handed tapping, and you'll see a lot of people's videos where they'll talk about like Steve Hackett, and they'll be like, Steve Hackett invented tapping, not Eddie. And he never claimed he invented it. He's even said that in interviews. He never claimed that he came up with two-handed tapping, but he did come up with like a different way of doing it. He came up with a different way of doing two-handed tapping. But, uh, yeah, came up with a different way of doing it. And, you know, kind of a unique way of doing it. It was almost like a song within a song. You know, everyone loved Eruption, and the way he played Eruption, you know, caused a lot of people to want to go out and get guitars, you know, and really brought a lot of people interest in the guitar, you know, not since like, you know, Jimi Hendrix had happened, and as many people probably wanted to play guitar, but yeah, you know, Van Halen are also kind of credited with being the band that kind of saved rock a bit, because disco was huge at the time, punk was... I guess people say it was huge. Punk was out there. I don't recall those bands really selling a lot of albums because I know like the Ramones, for example, didn't have their first album go gold until I think like a few years ago. That album that came out in 1974, I believe it was. But uh, yeah, those bands didn't sell a lot of albums. The Sex Pistols were big, but they were kind of one and done. You know, they were kind of one and done. They came out with that first album, then The Clash had come out. Clash had a couple hits, and then they were kind of done. Then you had New Wave coming in, and people were taking more of an interest in New Wave music. You'd have a number of those bands playing the Sunset Strip as well. But, you know, sometimes those bands would play shows with metal bands. You know, you'd have bands like the Motels, you know, play with like heavier kinds of bands or Devo would sometimes play with heavier bands. So you, you would have that on that scene. You know, you had that. You had, like I said, you know, a lot of bands on that scene. Like I said, Legs Diamond, you know, a band that was 
gaining momentum. Like I said, Gene Simmons took interest in them. But uh, another band that was kind of like really getting kind of big as well alongside Van Halen was Quiet Riot. You know, you had Van Halen and the other big band was Quiet Riot. Also a band that had a charismatic lead singer with Kevin DeBro. And you also had, you know, Randy Rhodes as the guitarist. Now, you know, there's always that question, you know, Eddie Van Halen or Randy Rhodes? You know, who do you prefer? You know, just kind of for fun, you know, let me know. You know, who do you prefer? Randy Rhodes as a guitarist or Eddie Van Halen? Personally, I would have to say Randy Rhodes. I know this is a video on Eddie Van Halen, but I think I've always kind of liked what Randy Rhodes brought to it a little more. I know his career was cut very short because he did die in a plane crash, but I did like that kind of neoclassical style that he brought to it. I know there were people before him who were doing it, like Yuli Roth and Richie Blackmore, but yeah, you know, he had, Randy had his way of doing it. Very dedicated musician. I know, I think it was Ozzy would say that when they would travel around Whatever town they were in, Randy would always look for whoever the great guitar teacher was in the area and take lessons with them. So he's always trying to improve, you know, as a musician. And Eddie was always constantly playing as well, too. They would talk about that as well. You know, Eddie was always trying, you know, constantly trying to improve, always working on song ideas, song licks, because Eddie wasn't just you know, a shredder, Eddie was a good songwriter. He could write good songs. You know, the songs were there. You know, I, I think people don't talk about his songwriting ability, but he had some good songwriting ability as well. So, but, yeah, so just let me know, you know, who you prefer, Randy Rhodes or Eddie Van Halen. Be interesting to see. But, uh, yeah, like I said, with me, I think it's more Randy Rhodes. I think I like that guitar playing a bit. At one point, I think Randy Rhodes' guitar playing had changed because when he got the Ozzy gig, you know, there's a story behind that, but when he got the Ozzy gig, he went to England, and then his style changed a bit because he had become more influenced by the new wave of British heavy metal that was happening happening in England at the time. Is where, you know, Eddie... Had his influences, you know, Eric Clapton, Leslie West, uh, you know, Jimmy Page, Jeff Beck. You know, those were his influences. And I think Ronnie Montrose, too. I think Ronnie Montrose is a huge influence, like I said. I hear it in in at, in Van Halen. I definitely hear that Montrose influence. But, uh, yeah, so, you know, just like I said, let me know. But, uh Anyways, yeah, Van Halen would, of course, as everyone knows, lose David Lee Roth as the singer. I guess they, they kind of left on good terms. David Lee Roth kind of left on good terms. I know David Lee Roth wanted to do more covers. Eddie really didn't. I don't know why Eddie didn't agree to it, because Van Halen, like I said, they could play like 300 different covers, and they would sound like Van Halen. But... uh yeah, for whatever reason, then, you know, David Lee Roth, you know, went solo and they kind of left on good terms. But then in the press, they were kind of attacking each other. Things got kind of bad because of that. And, you know, it's a shame, but, you know, they did, Van Halen did get Sammy Hagar. And I first heard, you know, the Hagar, Van Hagar, Van Halen. And... You know, like I said, I don't like it as much as the Eddie stuff, even though I do like Sammy Hagar and what he's done. He's done some great stuff. Also a great guitarist in his own right, Sammy Hagar. He's underrated as a guitarist. But, uh, yeah, so they put out more albums. Then, of course, Michael Anthony would be replaced by Wolfgang, Eddie's son. And then uh, they would you know, tour, they put out another album, 
And then, you know, there's been kind of a lack of output of Van Halen albums for the past 20, 25 years. I know Eddie Trunk has talked about that a lot. And uh, supposedly Eddie had still been writing, though. He's been writing a lot. There could maybe be as many as 10 or more albums that will come out in the future that haven't come out yet because Eddie supposedly has a ton of songs written, a lot of material. So who knows what will surface in the future. You know, I know Jimi Hendrix, they're still putting out Hendrix music, and he wasn't even around that long. You know, I know Frank Zappa died in December of 1993. I guess they've released as many as 53 Frank Zappa albums since he died. So there could be, I guess Eddie Trunk thinks it could be as many as 10 albums or more of unreleased material that could surface in the future. I know, like I said, you could always find stuff on YouTube, all these like concerts and these recordings that people have put up. You know, really some interesting stuff. You're so glad that, you know, someone was there and kind of, you know, hit the record button so you could listen to this all these years later. Otherwise, yeah, that would be kind of lost, wouldn't it have been? It would kind of be lost to history. I, I think it would have been. But, uh, yeah, definitely, you know, Eddie was, as we know, you know, and in credible guitar player, you know, didn't do a lot of interviews. I've heard some interviews, but, you know, he tended to do interviews only when he needed to. That's what Wolfgang said. Like he would do interviews when he needed to. And, yeah, but, uh, like I said before, an influence on Eddie Van Halen was Leslie West. That's the other person I wanted to talk about. Leslie West, as you know, was in the band Mountain. And supposedly what had happened is Leslie West, I guess was in a band, I want to say their name was the Vagrants. He was in that band, I think it was with his brother. They were trying to do some recording, but they didn't have songs. Um, so they were working with a producer the producer was a guy by the name of Felix Papillardi. I guess he liked Leslie West's heavy sound. And he agreed to form a band with Leslie West. However, he did release a Leslie West solo album in 1969 called Mountain. Now, a lot of people get confused. They think that was the first Mountain album. That was actually the first Leslie West solo album. But the name of the album was Mountain. So I know that confused some people. Then after that, I know because Mountain had the same manager as Jimi Hendrix did, they were actually able, Mountain was actually able to play Woodstock in like their third gig. You know, I think it was just their third gig. They ended up playing Woodstock. They weren't, I don't think they were on the Woodstock DVD recording or the Woodstock movie when it first came out, but I think they were in a later version, like some sort of like part two or some later version of that it had Mountain in it. But yeah, Mountain did play Woodstock and uh, they would then release some albums. They would release their first album, Climbing. That was technically the first Mountain album that had Mississippi Queen on it, which was their hit that gets played in all the rock radio stations. You know, that was played in a lot of stations. And I, sh I should say something about that because there was a radio station in San Antonio, Texas, and there was a show on that station by a guy by the name of Joe Anthony. He would play a lot of obscure stuff, a lot of deep cuts from bands, bands like Legs Diamond and YNT and Budgie developed a big following around the San Antonio area because of Joe Anthony. You know, it showed that these bands could have been big if the radio stations would have played them. But, yeah, I, I did want to say something on that because, uh, you know, I, I know... This music didn't always get played on certain radio stations, but Mississippi Queen by Mountain was played 
uh, and all the big rock radio stations. But there was more to Mountain than just that. You know, they also had Nantucket Sleigh Ride, which I know they extended, I believe, on a longer uh, to a longer version on a live album. They had this like long like jam tr- they did with the song and. You know, Leslie West would talk about that, where he would say sometimes on the live albums, our songs would get drowned out by these long jam sessions we had. And the fans would be like, you know, where's the song I know? (laughs) You know, because they would go into this long jam session. But yeah, Felix Papillardi was the bass player of that. He was also a producer. He wrote songs along with his wife. They also, he also worked with Cream, arranging Cream songs and writing Cream songs. So it's kind of like what Mountain was. It's kind of like an American cream in a lot of ways. Now, Mountain wouldn't be around for too long. They would play their last show at the very end of 1974. And they would play their very last show at the end of 1974. And they would then... Um, disband, but they will come to back together again later on and record other albums over the years. You know, Leslie West would also release solo albums. And, you know, sometimes he's regarded as one of the creators and developers of metal. You know, because Mountain did have a heavy sound very early on. You know, they were a band with a heavy sound. I know the origins of metal is something that could be debated, but yeah, you can't deny the fact that Mountain, you know, they definitely had a heavy sound and they had it very early on. So anyways, Felix Pebalardi, you know, helped write Mountain songs. You know, he wrote a lot of their material along with his wife. His wife actually designed those real cool mountain album covers. I just love those album covers, you know, like Climbing and Nantucket Sleigh Ride and the live album they did. That's some great album cover art. <clears throat> and yeah, they were like a team. They're like a husband and wife songwriting team. Fortunately, what happened in 1983, Felix Pavilardi came back to his apartment in the morning after spending the night with either a girlfriend or a groupie. And and when he came home, his wife had a gun that he had given her and she ended up shooting him and he died. But he was, he is is regarded as being kind of a musical genius, Felix Pepillardi. And I I think Leslie West had admitted that. He was like, yeah, I, I knew nowhere near on as much, you know, on music theory as Felix Pepillardi did. I think Felix Pepillardi had like a master's degree or something like that in music. But yeah, I did want to say that about Mountain. Uh, You know, also, like I said, Mountain, big influence on Van Halen, big influence on Eddie, you know, because people would talk about being influenced by um, Leslie West. You know, even though Mountain wasn't a huge band, a lot of guitar players will reference Leslie West, you know, and he's usually somewhere in the middle of the 100 greatest guitar players in Rolling Stone. You know, they usually put him somewhere in the middle. So, yeah, I did want to talk about that because, you know, rest in peace, Leslie West. Definitely, you know, if you haven't heard Mountain, some good music to discover. You know, the the deep cuts. I know everyone's probably heard Mississippi Queen, but there's some other great songs and great jams. If you like that kind of jam, long drawn out songs and jam music. And I, I just love that kind of stuff. There's a lot of that, you know, back in that era. You know, and another thing I do want to say before I end the video, I do want to say a little more on uh, Van Halen's Club Days. Because I just, um, it just occurred to me that, you know, I, I did talk about that whole scene, that whole L.A., you know, glam metal scene. You know, you did have Quiet Riot on that with Randy Rhodes. You know, of course, Quiet Riot was kind of volatile. I know their albums, the first two, I think, were released only in Japan. For whatever reason, I'm not sure exactly why, but uh, 
I know they were considered to be kind of volatile. There was some infighting in the band. I believe the bass player actually plotted to kill Kevin Debro at some point. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, Randy Rhodes, because of that, I think he did want to get out of the band, so he went for the Aussie audition. Now, Randy Rhodes is not a Black Sabbath fan, so, you know, with this whole um, Ozzy solo project, you know, it was kind of considered risky at that time. I think George Lynch actually got the gig early on, but Dokken was forming at the time, and George Lynch didn't want to do it because... You know, having a project with Ozzy Osbourne was seen as being kind of risky at that point. Ozzy was regarded as being kind of a mess in those days. People were kind of like, that guy will be dead in a year. Well, people have been saying that now since 1978, and it's almost 2021, and Ozzy Osbourne's still alive. But at the time, people were kind of like, yeah, he'll probably be dead within a year. It's very risky, but Randy got the gig, and you know, would go on to, you know, plan a couple Ozzy records, you know, people got to hear his, his sound, but yeah, you know, he was also on that club scene, the LA club scene, and if I get a chance, I do want to put, because Van Halen had these like flyers that I found online, these like early club show flyers are very interesting. One of them has like Donald Duck on it, it says Van Halen. You see that first Van Halen logo that uh, Mark Stone designed, it has a cool 70s style. I actually like that logo more than their more metal looking 80s logo or late 70s in the 80s logo. I like that they had in the mid 70s, you know, that logo that Mark Stone had designed. I mean, they didn't use it for long, but they did use it early on. Cool logo. But uh, they played with a number of bands. I know they played with a band called Smile. They would play with a band called Stormer. And I believe they would play with them at the Starwood. That had the bassist uh, who would later, the bass player of that band would later join Striper. But just a number of bands they would play. There was a band called Snow. There was a band called the Sharks, or just Sharks. You know, there was also a band called Eulogy. Van, Hale, Van Halen would play a lot of shows with Eulogy. I I should mention that. They would play a lot of shows with them. Eulogy had kind of an interesting sound. They were kind of like heavy rock. They were kind of like prog rock. They were kind of punk. They never got a record deal because, I, I don't know, I guess no one wanted to sign them because of that, but they, they were never able to get a record deal. However, the guitarist in that band, Rusty Anderson, would become a session guy, and later on, he would get the gig as Paul McCartney's guitarist. Pretty, gig, pretty good gig to have, I would say. But yeah, he's had that gig for 20 years, and he's been with Paul McCartney longer than any of the Beatles have, but he was on that scene. Rusty Anderson, you know, and uh, there were, you know, other bands, because I do like a lot of this underground stuff, and I wanted to look in to see what, you know, became of some of these other bands, you know. Everyone was trying to play the Starwood in those days. They all wanted to play that club. You know, I know that club was owned at that time by an individual by the name of Eddie Nash. I believe it was Eddie Nash. And he was a gangster. And, you know, there's a whole movie on him called Wonderland. I believe Val Kilmer's in it. That kind of gets into that. I won't get into that whole story. But there's another whole long story about, you know, the Starwood and, uh, you know, the owner of the Starwood, Eddie Nash. But, uh, yeah, so, you know, I, I wanted to say something about, you know, those flyers I came across because... It's interesting to see all those bands. I was looking up some of those bands. There's another one called Headwinds. And the guys from the band Headwinds would actually form a band called Dealer that had a very young Tommy Lee in it. Tommy Lee would mention that in the dirt, but he doesn't mention the band Dealer by name. He just talks about, yeah, briefly, I was with these guys. You know, well, it's the guys from Headwinds, a band that played shows with Van Halen. And, uh... Yeah, I guess the band didn't last long. 
they broke up. And then later, you know, Tommy Lee would end up joining Motley Crue. But, uh, yeah, so it's interesting, you know, to see these bands that play, that were a part of this scene, you know, that were a part of this, you know, early, you know, this is part of this like mid 70s LA scene, you know, that Van Halen was a part of. But, uh, anyways, that's all I've got. If you've watched this video, I hope you enjoyed it. Again, 2020 was a tough year, but uh, hopefully 2021 will be better for a lot of people. I wish everyone the best. I wish everyone good health and prosperity in 2021. If you watch this video, as always, I thank you for watching. Have a good night.